and action. Can you hear me? All right, thank you. All right, so, so today I'm going to talk about rack extension. Uh, but first, me. So uh, the only thing that was in my biography here in the program was I'm the CTO of Propellerhead Software. And that's sort of a dry biography. So I, I thought I'd introduce myself because we're going to spend the next 50 minutes together here. So I started coding as a kid. I've always been coding. Eventually, I thought I'd do something else. So I got a physics degree. But I, I just cannot resist coding. So, so here I am. I, I couldn't find any, any use for that quantum dynamics or anything. So, so I code, code, and code. And, and some, then in my spare time, I, I also grow mushrooms for fun. Uh, okay, so, so judging from th that reaction, I think we're thinking about different kind of mushrooms. <laughs> so I'm, I'm talking about oyster mushrooms. These are mushrooms that were grown by, by the German, uh, cultivated by the Germans during World War I for food. Uh, they get huge, but they taste terrible. <coughs> uh, and the, the beer there is, is for size comparison, although I, I do try to make my own beer as well. Okay, enough about that. That's not really why we are here. We are here about, uh, to talk about rack extensions. This talk is going to be very unpropeller headish. Usually at Propellerhead, we talk about release products. Like, okay, we released this product. It's got these features. You can do exactly this with this product. Or we released an SDK. This is exactly what you can develop with this SDK. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the potential of technology here. So what you can do with technology and be, think a bit forward. Um, so a bit unpropeller headish. It's a bit uncomfortable. Uh, please stay with me. First of all, I'm going to go through a background, and then I'm going to talk about the design goals of the technology, this, this plug-in technology that, that we have developed, uh, how we came up with the technical solutions we have, and then some examples of, of implementations. But, but first, I need to talk a bit more about propeller head and reason. Now, I promised myself that this is not going to be an ad for propeller head, it's not going to be an ad for reason, but we need to be on the same level for, for you to understand what, what the rest of the technology is about. So we make a DAW. It's called Reason. It's like other D DAWs. There are like a handful or, or two of them. Uh, you can do mixing. You can have plugins, effects instruments. You got a sequencer. You can do audio editing, everything like that. Uh, the, big, or the biggest difference is the workflow. So where other DAWs usually have like pop-up windows for, for plugins, we have this virtual rack interface, this physical rack. And uh, what that means that is that you have a coherent user interface for, for all the different in instruments and effects. You actually stack them on top of each other or next to each other. You have the same paradigms. You, 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 uh, you, you can turn the knobs and, and move the faders and everything in the same way. So you, once you learn one, one instrument, you will quickly be able to move on to the next one. It, it'll just, you'll just understand it. Uh, automation and everything works the same way for, for all of these. And having them next to each other, like glued together, also means that you can turn the rack around and you can do the, the, the cabling. And I'm, I'm sure most of you know about this. But, so you, we got CV cables there. We got audio cables there. And it's a much more fun way of working than having something looking like uh, Excel, where you say, okay, I want to connect this input to that output. So having this physical model uh, makes all that, all that possible. So this was the state up until 2012. So, so we had been working on Reason for maybe 12 years or something, and we had manufactured all the instruments and effects and utilities that you can find in the rack ourselves. There were like 30, 40 of them. Of course, Customers always want more, uh, and, and we don't really scale that well. We're only so many people, so we wanted to open the rack up to other developers. All said and done, we looked at the different competing formats, uh, plugin formats, and we weren't really happy with what we saw. There wasn't something that satisfied all our requirements. So we sat down, wrote down our, our requirements, and came up with uh, rack extensions, which is a native format of reason. And this is still just the background. And right now, there are more than 500 rack extensions for sale in our app store. So that it's an app for a model from 150 different developers. And 
to the customer, a rack extension is just that. It's a device that lives in Reason. It looks like a native Reason device. It works like a native Reason device. You have all the parameters, all the automation, CV, cabling, everything that you expect from a Reason device. In fact, all the devices that we have made at Propeller since 2012 have been rack extensions. So all the synthesizers and effects in Reason for the last six years are rack extensions. And it should just work for the customer. They should be able to buy, the, buy it, try it, uh, install it, move it between computers in a, in a very simple fashion. And we have different, in its, its app store, we have a different models. So you can buy them, you can subscribe to them, or, or you can rent to own. So that's for the customer. And for the developer, there is an SDK, a free SDK, and the developer can download it and use it. It's fairly easy to develop rack extensions. And you can sit on a Mac, and you can develop uh, for Windows and vice versa, or actually you develop on one platform, and it'll, it'll just work on all platforms. Uh, and we will distribute it for you, and we will sell it for you, and we will help you market it. Now, this is up until now, like this very moment, what people thought rack extensions were. Now I'm going to tell you exactly what rack extensions are. So this is the first, okay? You're, you're the first ones to hear it, except from, from, uh, from the people from Propellerhead. What can we actually do with rack extensions? First, starting up with the design goals from, from very long ago when we uh, sat down to, to look at this. Okay, caveat. So from now on, nothing I say here, you cannot hold that against me. <laughs> so I, it's not a proof of anything we're doing. We're doing this, this is just me, a tech guy, working or, or talking to you tech people and we're here to have fun, okay? Don't think about products, let's just enjoy this. <laughs> I'm gonna repeat this. <laughs> okay, back to the design goals. First of all, move responsibilities from, from plugin to host. When you look at other plugin formats, if I ever say VST, I mean all the different formats like VST, AU, et cetera, from, from that generation of formats. All of those are essentially small applications. You have to think about threading. You have to think about file system interaction. Um, you have to think about how to serialize yourself. Um, you have to think about the user interface. Like it, it, you probably have like this on draw call and you have to draw a rectangle, draw a line, uh, invalidate stuff, all of these things. And they're essentially boilerplate code. All the plugin manufacturers, they have to do exactly the same thing all of the time. They have to re reinvent the wheel. Granted, we're here at this sort of juice-ish conference, and, and juice solves a lot of that. And, and, and juice is great. But we wanted to lift that out, make that the responsibility of the host instead. Why, why ship it with all the plugins? Let's pull out as much as possible and just leave the cool stuff to the plugin, like cool DSP and a nice user interface. And then other plugin formats, they were like black boxes. You could, you could uh, like send MIDI or events to them. Uh, you could send audio to them and they will output some kind of audio or something. You don't know what they're doing. They could use all the cores or, on your CPU. Uh, they could send it off to the internet to do something. It could, it could, it could do something on the GPU. We don't know what, it's, what it does. But preferably, we would want to do, know what it, what it does because that would uh, enable us to help it. We could optimize things for it. Or we could do really cool tech things with it. So make it not a black box, but make us understand what's inside of that black box. And then when we developed this, we had Reason. It was a plugin format for Reason, at least that's what you still think. Um, and Reason exists on Windows and Mac OS and on, on x64. Uh, but we all know the rumors, you know, you know uh, Apple might go onto ARM sometime in the future, or who knows what the future holds in place. Maybe we will, we will run on, on, on Google Fuchsia on, on some weird hardware architecture in the future. We have no clue where we're running. And we would, we would like to be able to move all the plugins with the host, not just have everyone recompile and rebuild for the different operating systems and different hardware architectures. So if you build it for Reason, you've built it for Reason. And then Reason is also pretty well known for its stability. 
And we wanted it to stay that way even though we'd open up the plugins. You, granted, you, you can run plugins in, in, in different processes uh, to make the OS up, uh, handle that kind of stuff, but preferably we would want to run uh, the, the plugin inside of Reason, inside of the Reason address space. So if it's possible, make it run within the same address space uh, and as crash proof as possible. That would be a goal. And then for the end user, uh, make it easy to, to manage uh, manage the, the plugin. You want to be able to trial and buy and install and reinstall. If your computer crashes, you buy a new one. Maybe another type of computer, you should just click and, and it should just work. And for developers, make it easy to, to, to implement plugins and, and sell them and help, with, help them with that. The, the last two might not seem relevant, but you will see how they fit into this like a big jigsaw puzzle when, when it comes to the, the technical solutions. So let's talk about the solutions because these were the requirements going into it. You know, other plugin formats, you write them in, in, in one language, probably C++, probably not Rust. Uh, you need to come up with, a, with an architecture yourself. Uh, it's probably going to be a layered architecture. Uh, you're probably going to have some kind of a user interface. Then you might have a subsystem uh, with DSP code. Uh, you, you might have a subsystem with, with a data model. You need to keep track of your state. You will be, need to, to serialize yourself. You need to do some asynchronous stuff. Maybe you want to do that in the UI as well. Uh, maybe you want to have some undo history. So, so, but, but you still need to come up with this architecture yourself. And it's, it's, then, it's, then it's fairly easy for things to get messed up. You can have dependencies that you don't really want, or maybe you do want the dependencies in there. But there are definitely benefits of, of, of keeping these subsystems apart. Now, this picture is coming from the, from the VST3 uh, documentation. And they have this great suggestion that, okay, for the user interface, uh, please let the user interface talk to the rest of the plugin through the host, because way cool. Then you can run, for example, uh, the user interface on one computer, and you can run the DSP code on another computer. That's really an excellent idea. There are more ben benefits to it than that. Uh, we took that a bit further because this is still a, just a suggestion. There is nothing in VST3 that forces you to do this. These are the different subsystems of Rack extension. You have the user interface, you have a data model, you have a real-time controller. I will talk more about the real-time controller in a few minutes. And uh, you have the DSP code. And whenever I say DSP code, I mean real-time DSP code. Uh, big thing here. These different subsystems cannot talk to each other. It's all up to the host to make the communication between the subsystems. It's physically impossible for the DSP code to talk to the user interface. So that's, that's something that we do, uh, that we provide as a host. I'm going to talk, talk you through these different uh, subsystems, uh, starting with the data model, because that's quite central, isn't it? So instead of implementing a data model like you do in other plugin formats, you declare the data model here. So you declare it in Lua, and then the host will own the state of, of, the, of the data model. So, so it's not like the host will, uh, will, will tell you this parameter changed, uh, please do whatever you need, uh, uh, and then come and ask you to serialize yourself because it doesn't know the state. The host always knows the state. And then the host does all the threading and all the communication between the different subsystems. So the host will make sure that the, the, the state of the data model will end up in the user interface when it's needed. It will make sure that the data model uh, state will end up with the DSP code in the real time when it's needed. In fact, there is no such thing as threading going on uh, when, you, when you develop a rack extension. The whole concept of threading is completely hidden. You won't find it in the documentation. You won't be able to create a thread or, or join a thread or delete a thread. It's, it's just not there. We take care of that for you. And it could look something like this. It's, this is Lua. So you got a sample play uh, property here. It's a Boolean with a default value of false. That's, or 
a, a waveform there. That's, that's a number but, uh, like zero, one, or two. It's a step property. So there are a bunch of different type, uh, parameter types here. You could have strings, or you, you could have uh, blobs, or samples, or, or even native objects, which are like if you define something in C or C++. And, and by the host owning this, that means that you don't have to implement a subsystem or a part of a subsystem where you do uh, save or load state. We know exactly what you're doing and what you're up to. So we can save the state of the plugin. We can have an undo history because we know exactly what has happened to, uh, with the state over time. And we can integrate that with the undo history of, of all the other plugins and, and the rest of the DAW. So don't worry there, we, we got you covered. And then we have the user interface. It's also declarative in Lua. And it's, it's retain mode. You can, uh, instead, of, instead of having someone uh, implement, okay, draw this over here, draw this over here, invalidate, etc. cetera, uh, you just say, okay, I want a knob over here, I want a fader over here, uh, and, and they should change these parameters in the data model. So we maintain the state of it. We make sure it's drawn when it should be drawn. Uh, and when we did this, uh, we didn't know the future of displays. We, we didn't know how large the displays were going to be, and we wanted to make a future-proof format. Uh, they might be high DPI in like 50 inches or something. Uh, so, okay, let's, let's go with, with uh, vector graphics for it. We define the user interface. Of course, the extension of vector graphics for, for, the, uh, for the perfect future would probably be 3D. So in the first version of rack extensions we came up with, and this was in 2012, we said, okay, you need to do everything in 3D. Who knows, maybe you want to run Reason in a first-person shooter, uh, or, uh, well, or with 3D glasses, or more, maybe more, uh, probably more, more likely uh, that you want to have drop shadows from, from a knob onto, on, uh, to the device below. Uh, we quickly realized that not all, all developers have a, a 3D model, modeling knowledge. Uh, so we quickly added 2D as well there. It could look something like this. This is uh, an analog knob. The graphics node there points either to a 2D declaration or a 3D declaration of, of what the graphics should look like. So that, that graphics node filter frequency. So look like this. When you change this, param uh, this knob, when you turn the knob, change the data model property of filter frequency. And, and pay special attention to analog knob up there because uh, analog knob uh, that defines the behavior for the rack extension host. The rack extension host knows exactly what an analog knob is. Uh, so there is no like, uh, it doesn't know about click or click drag or anything that's up to the host because on Windows it's probably going to be click, drag, click, drag. But if you're running this on, a, say, a tablet in the future, you, well, who knows what, what, what the interaction model would be. Maybe it's like you want to touch the device and, you, and, and when you touch, touch it, uh, the, the, the widget would move to the side and you could swipe up or down and maybe you want to turn the finger in, in circles or something. Uh, that would be up to the host developer to, to implement, to, to get a common behavior between all the plugins on that particular host. We don't know exactly what it's going to run on. So the, the plugin developer doesn't really know about the interaction model. That's up to the host. And then we get to the real-time controller. You can see that the real-time controller is sitting in, in between data model and DSP. And that's because it's there to facilitate communication between data model and DSP. It's there to transfer the data model and massage the data model so that it, it's available for, for real-time computa uh, computations. You could think of it as a driver for, for real-time code. Uh, and, and the way you do that is by registering Lua functions to react on data model changes. Now, uh, these functions, so, so what you do is, is you, you uh, implement these Lua functions to react on data model changes, and then they can, can calculate something offline uh, asynchronously and they can and save that and, and transfer it to the DSP. So that's how you do asynchronous calculations for the DSP. And 
pay attention here because these Lua functions, they need to be pure. They cannot have any side effects. So we took a lot of inspiration from, from uh, functional programming here. So there are multiple reasons you would want to do something like this. One is, of course, if they don't have any side effects, uh, then we can cache the results. If you call the same function twice with the same parameters, well, of course, you should return the same results, so we could have cached the result and use it again. So that's an optimization possibility. Also, the real-time controller is there for, for asynchronous uh, processing. We might have a thread pool here uh, working on, on the RTC scripts. Uh, if, you, if you have functions that are not pure, they would probably not be pure because you're saving a state in a global variable, and that global variable that would live in a Lua virtual machine, and the Lua virtual machine would only live in one thread. So if this function got called in different threads, you wouldn't see the state from the previous call. So then, then it would be uh, um, host dependent, what, what the behavior would be like. And that's for Lua. You can do that with cool meta tables and stuff in Lua. Uh, the same thing goes for C++ because you can call C++ from this, this function. Um, you cannot have any side effects in your C++ code. Does that sound okay? So, so one way of having side effects in C++ code is uh, by having uh, global variables. So if, we call, you, if you, we call you, you can save your state in a global variable and then you will know it the next time we call you. Well, we will prohibit global variables because in this SDK, we provide our own LLVM-based uh, tool chain. We inserted a pass there that prohibits uh, global variables. So you will actually get a compilation error if you compile C++ code with, with global variables. And usually the reaction is never ever neutral when I, when I say something like that. It's either love or hate, uh, but no one is ever neutral about it. Uh, well, you're, you're all neutral, that, that's okay. Uh, yep, yeah. and let's have a look at an example. Here, uh, we're listening to the system sample rate, so we're setting up a hook here. If the system sample rate changes, let's call the on sample rate changed uh, Lua function, which is defined just below. In there, uh, you, you call load sample asynchronous, asynchronously with, with a, a file path that points into the, into the plugin itself. This uh, you will fall through and it will return a future uh, to that sample, which you then store in the data model and then you fall through. So this will like, you will execute this very quickly and it will start a background loading of this sample, which the host, host will take care of and you will be notified later on uh, when it's finished. And then we have everything prepared for the DSP code. You have this sample loaded, you have all the properties sent over to the DSP code. Now we just need some DSP code there. And Finally, something you're familiar with, you can, write the, you can write it in C++ just like you do in another plugin format. So you, you write your DSP code in C++, um, not in Sol yet. Uh, and as I said, we provide our own, uh, our own LLVM toolchain in the SDK. Uh, what you do not upload to us are uh, the DLLs or dynamic libraries you instead upload LLVM bitcode, the intermediate code that's used in LLVM. It's sort of an, an, an assembly code that's not directly targeted towards a specific hardware architecture. Uh, and then we keep a repository of all the rack extensions with this LLVM bitcode and, and the user interfaces on our servers. And then we target that towards the platforms that Reason is running on, right? So we retarget that towards Windows and Mac on x64 right now. And we make sure they end up with the customers. So that was for hardware. Now, we wanted to run on all operating systems as well. So we manage, uh, we do static verification of the dependencies here of this LLVM bit code. You cannot depend on anything that exists in, in the operating systems. The only thing that you can call is back into the host itself. You can never ever rely on, on doing something with the operating systems. You're completely sandboxed. And we will manage allocations. 
you will actually call into us. You don't know that, but you will call into the host to, to allocate and deallocate stuff. So if the user tries to remove your plugin or if you crash, we can deallocate everything. We can, we can free all the memory that you allocated during, during runtime. And we also make sure that if you, ha if you have any exceptions, specifically hardware exceptions, but, but all exceptions actually, if you have any exceptions, we will just kill you. We have a virtual fuse system. So if, if we burn that virtual fuse, the user will get a message saying, hey, this plugin uh, it stopped working. You can still go on and save your document, et cetera. We, we don't crash, but it doesn't work, and we're not going to call that anymore. And we also know exactly everything about where, where the memory on the heap is for this plugin. So we can do some background memory scanning to make sure that all the different subsystems that you implemented are act not actually talking to each other. And for distribution, so now you already know that we have a central re repository of all the plugins ever made, because that's an essential part of being able to move between platforms. Now just add central license handling to that, and the central build pipeline, and central distribution, uh, uh, then you have this big piece of the puzzle for, for an App Store model. So now you see how the App Store model fits on top of, uh, of the rest of the technology, like a, like a big jigsaw puzzle. Okay. So it's quite obvious by now that, that this has been a reason. It's been a reason since 2012. That's quite a long time ago. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the recent implementation here. I will talk about other implementations because we, we like to have fun at Propellerhead. So what I'm going to show you now uh, are a bunch of prototypes. These are not uh, products that we're actually going to sell. Or, well, who knows? But we're not selling them and we're not, we haven't presented them to anyone but you in, in this room. Or, or if I'm being live streamed on the internet, now everyone will know. <laughs> uh, first one is... This year, uh, we released Reason Compact. That's an, an iOS uh, version of, of, it's not really a Reason, but it has lots of Reason code base in it. Uh, it runs Europa. That's the flagship synthesizer of Reason from Reason 10. Uh, we got there uh, from using Bitcode, this exact, exactly the same way we would have, we would have done with a with third party product. We take the Bitcode and we target iOS. It's actually running. You can get it on the App Store right now. Uh, what we did have to do was, you know, a phone is a quite a small thing. We, we couldn't fit a 19-inch rack in there. So we, we took that entire sub, uh, subsystem of, of user interface. We took it off, and we replaced it by, by coding the user interface manually in this app. And this is to, to prototype and understand what the requirements are for, for running rack extensions on, uh, on a mobile phone. So we're, we're thinking about this and we're working on it. Uh, we will end up with a solution sometime. Then we've got two players in there, Scales and Chords and Dual ARP. Players are rack extensions, which are MIDI effects. They take MIDI in and they send MIDI out. These are also coming from, uh, from Reason. So Europa, Scales and Chords, and Dual ARP, they're coming from Reason. And they're running in Reason Mobile. And it works. It really works. It's, it's awesomely cool. Uh, and what's even cooler is that the things that we haven't released, we, we can actually run third-party rack extensions inside of this. So, so in our office, we can, we can play around with other people's plugins on iOS that they thought they developed for something running on Windows and Mac OS. So that was mobile. Let's talk about hardware. So there is this company called Mind Music Labs. It's also a Swedish, uh, it's Stockholm-based company. And they make this uh, real-time music operating system, system called Elk. Uh, because it's real-time, they can get really low latency. And, and you can actually uh, use a lot of the CPU because, well, you don't have unexpected interruptions. It's really a real-time operating system. So we're working together with them uh, uh, to, uh, to bring rack extensions to hardware. Uh, and I'm going to show a cool demo in a few moments. But before I do that, let's, let's take a look back at, at last year's ADC, because there was this talk here at ADC last year about Xenomai. It's, it's sort of a Linux distribution. 
where you can run a Linux kernel next to a, a real-time kernel. So you can say that this, this real-time kernel, it should run on that core, or those cores. And the Linux kernel should run on these cores. And, and you get real, real-time properties on, on, on whatever is running in the real-time kernel. You cannot do much. You can do calculations, of course. Uh, you can't do really much uh, uh, in there, uh, though. Uh, the cool thing with, with Xenomai is that you can have an application with an address space that spans both of these kernels. Does this sound like a fit for, uh, for uh, rack extensions? I already told you that the DSP here, it doesn't have any dependencies whatsoever to, uh, um, uh, to the operating system. So that, that could definitely be a fit. I also told you that the communication between the different subsystems are implemented by the host. So we could, of course, implement that in a way that works on Xenomai. And then the data model and real-time controller are things that actually need to talk to disk and, and do other things in Linux user space. Well, it could do that because it can run in the same address space, but inside the Linux kernel. Now imagine there is a Stockholm-based company uh, making an operating system called Elk with very similar traits to what I just showed you. And uh, imagine that I I brought a, a demo of this. So, uh, oh, I didn't say anything about hardware. Uh, we've been prototyping together with Mind Music Labs. Uh, we got this up and running on Elk, on uh, Atom-based boards, and also on ARM Cortex A7 boards, which is pretty cool. So we could actually take code that was meant for x64, running on Windows and Mac OS, and run it on 32-bit ARM Cortex A7. So inside of, inside of this extremely cute box uh, with pink roses that I stole from my daughter's room just before coming here, it was actually a perfect fit. Uh, I was looking for a box anywhere in the house that, that would fit this hardware, and this was it. So, so on two thirds of the talks I've, I've gone to today, uh, they've been talking about, no, well, I'm gonna do a live demo here. Uh, but none of them brought hardware that wasn't connected before the talk. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, inside of this, uh, is th there are two rack extensions inside of this, and they are both from Korg. It's a, a Monopoly and a Poly 6, and they were develop, uh, developed by Korg to run in reason as rack extensions. You can find them on, on our app store. Uh, what, what they probably weren't expecting when they developed these uh, a couple of years ago what, was that they were gonna run on this custom-made hardware on this custom-made operating system, on a real-time operating system. Okay, let's see if we can get this up and running. By the way, we asked uh, Korg if we could tell it's, it's their stuff. Okay, lights on. Okay, maybe this wasn't a good idea after all. <laughs> Let me just reboot this thing. We got uh, Monopoly with... So it, has, it, it can load the same presets as it does in Reason. Uh, let's see if we can get uh, this uh, thing sounding, uh, sounding a bit differently. Let's uh, take the Poly 6.
Okay, I'm plugging this before anything breaks. <laughs> yeah. Whew. Thank you. Okay, let's move on with this. Um, we already did the Showtime thing. <laughs> let's move on to another platform. Let's talk about web. So there, there were uh, two, uh, two talks about running, uh, running audio on web just before this in this particular room. Now, what is a web browser? So it has a retain mode user interface. It's sandboxed. You cannot access uh, the operating system at all. It's really, really, really sandboxed. Nowadays, it can render uh, real-time audio using Web Audio API, and it has its own architecture, which is called WebAssembly, uh, WASM. So does this remind you of anything? So six, seven years ago, when we were working on rack extension technology, we were like, joking to each other, maybe maybe we could run this in a web browser, maybe in the future, maybe, maybe, and then we started laughing and we drank beer. <laughs> well, we had to go, we, we had to, we just had to try this. The, we got this rack extension archive, we have 500 of these archives from the different developers. We got 2D and 3D UI assets. So, so we have this, this way of, of a, a tool chain to render bitmaps and sprites suitable for the web there. We put that in place. We have UI scripts in Lua. We have RTC scripts, real-time controller scripts in Lua, and, and, and user definitions in Lua. Well, uh, we transpile those to JavaScript. There is such a thing as, as a, a Lua to JavaScript transpiler, at Propellerhead at least. And then, we, then we get these UI assets which are optimized for web. Then, okay, go into LLVM bitcode. We have all the DSP code as LLVM bitcode for these plugins. We do some, some uh, pre-processing of, of this bitcode. Uh, one thing we actually, we, we do for example is, uh, there might be LLVM simd intrinsics in there. If you were here during the last talk, you, you would know that, that WebAssembly doesn't support simd right now. It might do that in the future. So we put a pass in there to replace that LLVM simd uh, instructions. Uh, with, uh, with scalar instructions instead. So we do, do a, a bit of magic there, then we run it through Inscripten, and we get WebAssembly uh, with, with DSP code. And then patches and resources, we just, well, it's just, just presets and, and like wave files and stuff. We can just put that on the web. So we could have a compiled rack extension that's, that's usable on the web here. We were doing this, um, working on it in January uh, this year. And then suddenly, like, okay, so we're gonna use this shared read buffer. That's probably a good way to communicate things between threads. Oh, it's disabled, shit. So you know about this, this Spectre and Meltdown uh, CPU bugs, like spec um, speculative execution bugs in, the C in modern CPUs. Uh, well, it turned out that that shared array buffer was a really good vector uh, to do timing attacks on a web browser uh, to, to use this Spectre uh, vulnerability. So I was just like plainly gone from Chrome from one day to another. And now, now I think it's back again because they, they uh, put other security play measures in place, uh, at least on, on desktop. Uh, I didn't really think that this was going to affect me personally, like Spectre and Meltdown, it's really cool to read about it, but like I do software development for audio people, like this is not really for me. Well, it, it turned out it was. So just, a, just a fun side note. Okay, let's, let's show a bit of this. Mm, I think I wanna start reason first. and connect the audio. So this is, this is what the reason rack uh, looks like. So you've got a rack here, uh, and then you have a device browser next to it, and then you can, you can, you can drag devices, you can instantiate them by just, just dragging them over here, and you can, you can play them. 
So this is the Europa. This is the, the uh, rack extension that was running inside of, of uh, Recent Compact as well. Uh, and then I just want to add before moving on to web uh, that we have something called players. I also mentioned that. Those are MIDI effects. You can stack them on top of, of, uh, of the synthesizers to affect the MIDI. So I have a, a small arpeggiator. So this is what it looks like in Reason. Let's switch over to Chrome. Did you see how fast that loaded? <laughs> so we're, not, we're not really looking at Reason compiled through MSquipton to run in a web browser. This is a really thin uh, rack extension hosting for the web. It's web native. It's, it's really just web and nothing else. We don't do any, any weird things in here. And over here, there are a bunch of, of rack extensions that we compile using this tool chain because we can mechanically move all of these 500 rack extensions to any other platform. <coughs> so we, we took a few of them and, and moved them over to the web here. The first one here is Europa. Does it look like something you just saw? It has the same patch format because it's up to the uh, up to the, the rack extension host to implement the patch format, the preset format. So we could imp implement the same one we we're running in Reason, and the same one that we were running in this one, uh, in the hardware over there. So you could you could potentially uh, have all the content as well. But pick pick something. <laughs> You see the user interface here? This, this user interface here, it, it's not a big canvas. This is web. So we, we took the Lua script with all the definitions of all, of all the widgets here, and uh, we uh, made it into, into something that's rendered by the web browser. So this is not the canvas that we render using WebAssembly or, or JavaScript. This is the web browser rendering it as quickly and as it possibly could, because that's what a web browser does. The only thing that's uh, pretty much that's running uh, in, in WebAssembly is the DSP code. Now, this wouldn't be half as exciting if it wasn't for the fact, uh, if, if, if it was just this one, because we have the source code to, to Europa. We could potentially do this anyway. Uh, well, so, so, okay, so, so there are other, you can, you can load other reason, uh, propeller and synthesizers in here if you wanted to. <laughs> Uh, but, but the cool part is that, of course, we could potentially run exactly the same synthesizers that, that I was just running over there, and they are sold in our shop from third-party developers. So this is, this is, this is Korg Monopoly that, that was developed by Korg for running, in, for running in Reason originally. This is Poly6. And the players here, the MIDI effects, they're also rack extensions. So they could potentially be used the same way, right? So you could hook them up in a render graph. You could stack them. With this weird sound, with this weird sound, uh, I just want you to, to imagine this this fact that we have 500 plugins from 150 different vendors that we can make run on pretty much any platform you can imagine now and in the future. And then I want you to stop imagining that.
because you cannot use this information for anything. <laughs> Except you can go to propellers.com slash developer if you're at least interested in, in what we're doing. Uh, what you find there is, is only information about uh, making rack extensions for reason because that was the only uh, information available up until this talk. The rest of the stuff is just prototype stuff. Uh, stuff that we're thinking about, stuff that we've been thinking about for the last decade. Uh, so we will continue to think about this and, and work on, on cool stuff in the future. And you have like three minutes to ask me questions or you'll have to buy me a beer tonight. <laughs> Hi, uh, first of all, thanks, great talk. Um, I think most of the portability is because of the very clear, distinct, uh, yeah, separation of concerns, well thought out uh, as, yeah, as I, I've seen in this uh, presentation. Um, can you tell me some problems developers had in the uh, past with the real-time controller, uh, what type of work mm -hmm. is done there, and what issues did people come to you with uh, uh, regarding the pure functional uh, aspect of that? Uh, the, 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 large, uh, the most number of problems people have had uh, is if they've had a large code base uh, that, that uh, with, with lots of code that wasn't pure, with lots of side effects, and, and that didn't have all these strict boundaries. So if you had this like, uh, VST with blurred boundaries I showed in the beginning with, uh, where you had dependencies, then, then it's a tough, tough task to move to rack extension where you have these boundaries and we really we enforce all these strict rules just to be able to do all this cool stuff. Be people didn't know that. So when, when we came up with this, uh, this technology, they were like, oh, this is really super hard. We don't understand why you're doing this. And this is why. We wanted to make it strict because then you can do cool stuff with it in the future. But, but uh, yeah, uh, mostly people who wanted to port existing stuff that didn't, uh, uh, like, the architecture didn't work well with, uh, with what we were doing. Of course, if they did something nice uh, with good architecture, it would have fit directly. Uh, thank you very much for that. I uh, don't have any question. I just want to say one thing. Um, this morning we heard how it would be really cool if we could do all this stuff in the future. Um, we just saw you do it for real. Uh, and you've been doing it for four years. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is like six years. Six years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th I, I've been really eager to tell you all this for a long time because like, we've been doing this uh, in, in the hidden. Uh, and it's, it's, it, at Propeller, we don't really talk about this, uh, about the products or technology, except the things that we have released. So this is a new for us. Uh, we're, we're just trying new grounds here. Hi. Um, first of all, great talk. That was really cool. Um, quick question to start off, if possible. Um, is there a name for that hardware device, device you've just showed us? Or is it purely uh, uh, speculative just yet? Uh, well, I would have to ask someone from, from Mind Music Labs then, because it's a prototype. Okay. It's, it's, it's a very, very prototypish thing that ho barely works. No, it, it does work pretty well. <laughs> At least nine <laughs> times out of ten. Um, and my, my main question is, uh, it, it's really cool seeing, uh, seeing this run on the web. Um, you mentioned it's transpiling Lua to JavaScript. Uh, I'm guessing that's primarily WebOD API. Um, running there. Uh, no, the, the, web, uh, the web audio stuff is, is mostly uh, that, that's mostly uh, LLVM stuff that we compile to, to WebAssembly. Uh, that's, uh, that transpilation, that uh, Lua to JavaScript, that's mainly for, for RTC scripts, real-time controller scripts. And I wasn't, uh, uh, I lied a bit to you as well. Uh, because you can, in fact, uh, do direct drawing in the user interfaces. You, you, can, you can implement small displays in your rack. And if you do that, you implement them in Lua, and then, then we needed to, to transpile that, that Lua to JavaScript to make it run fast in the browser. Okay, okay. That's very good. Um, I, you basically answered my, you preempted my next question, which was, um, like, you, like you're saying on, on screen right now, it's nothing's been revealed, and there's no proof of, of an upcoming product, but I do hope one's coming. Um, but have you thought of sort of 
w once you put stuff on in a browser, there's sort of security concerns. Um, is that something that, if it is an upcoming product, is that something that's being factored in as far as, say, um, IP or anything like that? All oh, right, you mean like licensing and, and piracy and stuff? The, yeah, that kind of no, thing. No, we haven't really thought about that yet. Okay. So we haven't come that far. We're just so happy it works. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Hope to see more of it. Thank you. All right, we've got time for one more question. Hello. Uh, we are convinced this is a really a great format, uh, but unfortunately we also need to support other plugin formats. So is there any kind of uh, best practice, let's say, to do cross-platform development uh, with your format and other format? How, how do you mm -hmm. handle uh, the, the need to support uh, other plugin formats, given that you are mm -hmm. so different? Yeah. So what I would do right now is I would start building a rack extension first, and, and then I would uh, I would try to make that into another format because we are the ones who are the most strict. So you can take our architecture and, and build it into other formats, but you can probably not start somewhere else and try to port it to a rack extension. That, that will make it more cumbersome. So, so start with rack extensions. So. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>